Welcome everybody to Radicalized Truth Survives, episode 115. We are going to be introducing you to RadPod's Teacher of the Year, Joanna Johnson, Joe the Veep, as I like to call her. She's an influencer, an educator, and we're going to be talking about the end game of capitalism. Have a listen. Who doesn't know what a tariff is? As always, I'll do it myself walking around telling people what a tariff is when he has no idea what a tariff is. Pay attention. Tariff. Are you ready? Do you have paper out? Let's go. Very simply, a tariff is a tax. Oh, Republicans didn't like those things. On imported Goods that are coming into your country from another country. Goods. With me so far, Donald? Exhausting is what it is, teaching all the TikTok. All right, let's say there's a 3% tariff on iPhones. With me so far? Follow me. This 3% tax is by the U.S. government. They are putting this tax on iPhones. So let's say our iPhones are getting made in, I don't know, China. The 3% tax is not being pushed to China. China is not paying the import tax. Chinese businesses are not paying the tariffs. Are you with me so far? Smart people get it. It's the 3% tariff, the tax, actually goes to the business in the United States that is importing, bringing in the iPhones. So the tax, not on China, but on the US business bringing in the merchandise. Denying this is denying all reality. Now the 3% tax on the US business, or Canadian if we're talking about Canada, actually gets put on their merchandise. Do you think, A, the business absorbs the cost and they take less of a profit, or B, do you think they pass this cost off to the customer and increase the cost of the iPhone. You didn't say B, I really don't think you have any hope of understanding anything ever. So as tariffs go up, the cost of the product to the consumer goes up. China doesn't pay, the business doesn't pay, and Trump doesn't pay. Now if the argument is they're going to raise tariffs to force manufacturing to come back to the United States of America so they can increase manufacturing on U.S. soil, fine. However, costs are going to go up because there's a reason manufacturers left the United States in the first place to get cheap labor, no environmental regulations, no health and safety protection for the worker. The only way to bring this back to the United States and watch costs go down is to break unions, lower wages, ignore environmental regulation, and ignore health and safety. If you think that's for the worker, again, I can't help you. Joe the Veep, Joanna Johnson. Oh my gosh, we are so excited to have you here with us today. I, I think I told you when I first reached out to you, when I discovered your tariff video, which we just saw, I binged your whole timeline. I'm like a fan girl. Oh, cool. You I'm went like, back to the lip syncing? Good I, did. I, did. I did. I did. I binged the timeline. I love your mother. I too came by my <laughs> shopping, honestly, through my mother. I absolutely adore the fact that you are a, a really wonderful um, talent and comedian, but you also are taking on incredibly important topics and introducing them to an audience in a way where we can all understand it. And before we get to some of that, can you sure. just uh, uh, introduce ourselves to your audience, to our audience? 
Oh, wow. I love this, this quick bio. Um, I'm a, I'm a teacher. I, I've been teaching for 22 years. I am now vice principal and, and helping to run and navigate the brand new sort of direction and, and culture and ethos of the school. Um, I kind of fell into social media. Everybody got locked down in Canada three months. It was on, you know, zero. We couldn't go anywhere. We couldn't do anything. And my friend's son, uh, Charlie said, Joe, you got to join TikTok. And I said, get out of here. I've been shown TikToks. They're ridiculous dancing. What am I going to do? I'm not going to dance. And one day I was taking my mom's dog to the vet in the weird ways that you had to take, the, you know, you had to take the dog and you don't even go yeah. into the vet with COVID and you wait in your car and I'm waiting my car and he downloaded it. And I did my first TikTok. And then what I realized is that it was this lovely connectivity. It was this lovely kind of creative expression that I didn't even know I was. My friends all thought I was having a mental breakdown. Uh, true story. I got some serious, are you okay? You, are you, should we send somebody? Um, and then one day I, I did a video. I never thought about politics or educate, nothing like that on, on this app. Uh, and I did a video about Doug Ford. And I, and it was kind of off the cuff. I believe I might've been even in a car wash. Like it was just very off the cuff, very much like, what are we doing? Um, I'm not happy with this. I think we need to be able to do better. And then I realized with the feedback is that people are dying for a few things. They actually want to talk about politics mm -hmm. and education in intelligent, calm, collected ways, even if we disagree. They want it to be authentic and they want it to be clear. And if you can throw in a wink and maybe a touch of sarcasm, it just goes down a lot nicer. And I thought, oh my, oh my God, I can do this on the app. And then here we are. Uh, so what's so incredible about that is that I look at it as a star is born and I'm serious because what, what is required for what you do is a depth of knowledge and really great natural comedic timing. And you have both. And just in the clip we saw, you're informed, uh, you have a, an easy way to relay it. You're hilarious. Like Thank literally you. like, like if, if you don't understand this now, you throw the chalk, you march off. I love when you like peel off the shirt to get down to the other <laughs> t-shirt in order to roll up the sleeves and, you know, do the work. And it's like, you know, we, it's true. We're craving that. We in America have a fight on our hands that I would hazard to say the majority of the population is not aware that it's like democracy versus authoritarianism. No. Like they're still kind of mired in the political, you know, like, oh, like, like the horse race. And we have a really deadly fight on our hands. And we are in a, in a, in a time when there's so much access to information everywhere but a, a lack of facts penetrating. So again, that is why I appreciate your gifts. And can you give our viewers a sense of the parallels of the fight in Canada to America that you're seeing on the political front? You know what? I think it's, and I don't think it's new, guys. I think that we, we have shifted into a social media age in which it becomes glaringly apparent and magnified to a level we've never seen before. But I think the propagation of fear, the reduction of a one-liner in order to sell a product, whether that product is Nike shoes or the prime minister's office. Um, and I think the, the heightened wow. level of adversarial politics in order to ensure that if you, if you are on my side, I will take care of them and it doesn't matter who they are. That changes every generation. It, um, I'll take care of them. I will make your life better. It's very, and I talk about this in my class all the time. It's very Hobbes, right? It's very Leviathan. People will give up all of their civil rights for the promise, not for the reality, but for their perception of the promise of food on the table security and safety for their family and everything go else goes by the wayside mm -hmm. and obviously as you guys are are seeing it with trump we're seeing it with a lot of 
very right wing people. Um, and we're seeing their personalities be the focal point rather than their policies. But this isn't new. I don't think it's new, guys. Yellow journalism way back in Hertz and Pulitzer days did the same thing. If it bleeds, it leads. That is no different than what we're seeing now. The only difference is, is that we have it sort of on this epic scale, possibly of awareness. Um, but I think, funnily enough, in this world where we have all the information as you know at our fingertips, as we say, and it is all right here, we also have the need or the the drive for somebody to tell us it's going to be all right. I have a simple solution. You're going to follow me. This is a, it's as basic as it gets. And by the way, nothing's basic, never has, never will be. But this is as basic as it gets. You don't have to worry about all of that information that you can't sift through. Just just follow me. I got you. And there's something very comforting about that. And I think people who are worried and and who can't pay their mortgage and their jobs have gone overseas and 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 they're they're desperately looking for that, right? And I know Hi-Fi has a question, but I just want you to give them the flip side, what the reality of that that really has meant historically. So I understand what they're looking for, but they don't deliver. What, what can we expect that they will get if that that actually wins in America and elsewhere? You'll get less choice. You'll get less choice, and what you'll get is this is 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 a pretense of success and i think some people want to buy it so much that they'll that they'll live in that fake world because that's where they feel more comfortable and if they can imagine it and they can just pretend that it exists it actually makes them feel better and and it's very i have a tattoo on my arm from i think like episode 2 of star wars don't hate me because it's from episode 2 because it was a great quote but I think about it often because I think about it throughout history. I think about it, obviously, under Hitler. You think about it under a lot of dictatorships and a lot of um, horrific sort of genocidal leaders, um, both culturally and physically. So this is how liberty dies with thunderous applause. There, it's a perfect quote. And, and it's a perfect quote that speaks to, we hand it over. We cheer for these people, predominantly men, although there have been some women that have led kind of these kind of charges. Margaret Thatcher tends to come to mind. Um, and we cheer for them because they've created a, a, a sort of a false enemy. They've created the bad guy, the boogeyman in the closet. They pointed their finger and they say, I'm going to control them, I got you. I'm going to take care of that, whether it be obviously the Jewish community during the Holocaust, whether it be immigrants for Trump right now, whether it be unions in Margaret Thatcher's regime, right? I'm going to stop that so you have a better life. When in actuality, what they're doing is they're chipping away at our freedoms, at our rights, all the while propagating, all the while screaming at the top of their lungs about freedom for everybody. It's a very interesting balance. And then you see the resurgence, obviously, of religion and theocratic leanings. Um, and again, why is that the case? All the respect in the world to people who have faith. But when you're leading a country with it, you're looking for a simplistic solution that was written 5,000 years ago in a document to apply it to today because you don't want to think for yourself and decide, is this the right thing? I just want to give a Bertrand Russell quote to buttress what you just said, which just hit me like right in my heart. First, they fascinate the fools, and then they muzzle the intelligent. Sure. And, um, and thank you for that. It's been a lot on my mind. My column this week in Byline Times was about how in order to get to American redemption, which I believe is the last best hope, which is a Abraham Lincoln quote, we actually need people of faith to step up and get back to what it actually means to them and not be dazzled by this shiny object that sure. they think will bring them to power. High fidelity, I don't wanna, I mean, I could keep talking to her all day, so. Well, pause just for one second, because I wanna talk about Lincoln, because one of my favorite Lincoln quotes ever 
And I use this time and time again is I'd like to have God on my side, but I must have Kentucky. So we can't take Lincoln. We can't take Lincoln out of that group because he knew what was right. And this is the danger of politics. He knew what or life, let's be honest. He knew what was right, but he knew what he needed to do in order to hopefully get to what's right. And the more we put off our morals and our ethics in order to possibly one day get to what's right, the less ethical and moral we become. Sorry. I, sorry. I'm just like, I'm, I'm so grateful to be speaking with somebody who reads books <laughs> like that. That has been a thing. High fidelity right. and I read books and that has been a thing that has been sucking the life out of America, like a fucking vampire. Sure. And so I've been reading, like I, I wrote about how I woke up, couple of mornings ago to a crime scene and the crime scene was highlighter ink all over my duvet cover because oh. oh. I was literally like finishing this book called The Grave Diggers, which right. is about the winter of the last winter of the Weimar Republic. And the reason it took me so long to finish this book is I stopped and I kept reading the source material books in the middle of it. Bella Fromm's Berlin Diary, oh. like literally like Dorothy Thompson's Who Goes Nazi, like all throughout, I kept on mining it, and then I finally finished it and wrote a piece about how uh, the grave diggers didn't have to triumph. It's literally like Hitler did not have to come to power. It was a mixture of like some scheming people and some greed, and you know, Bob's your uncle, I guess. I or yeah. I don't, I don't even want to say what it is. High fidelity, high fidelity. Bob's your fascist uncle. Uh, no. <laughs> We all have one. We all have one, guys. Yeah. 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 You just you lock them in the family room during holidays. Anyway, um, <laughs> feed a turkey underneath the door jam. Right. <laughs> Uh, so here's here's a question I have. Since you know we're talking about a lot of things, but uh, we're talking about religion, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the big things I hear from the Christian right is that we need Jesus and we need God back in schools. Sure. And a lot of people who are not believers are like, absolutely not. You know, separation of church and state. Mm -hmm. I actually kind of go the other direction, and I'd like to bounce this idea off you and get your thoughts as you are an educator. I say we bring God and Jesus back into school. I say we also bring Muhammad and Allah. I also <laughs> say we bring Yahweh. I also mm -hmm. say we bring Hinduism. Uh, let's bring the Bhagavad Gita in. Let's bring the Tibetan Book of the Dead and let children have an understanding of the subject of religion. Yes. I, I teach oh, a world well, religions easy. class. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm with you. I teach a world religions class. It's an elective. I've often said it should be mandatory. And it's not mandatory to indoctrinate. It's mandatory because there is no indoctrination when I'm teaching. And the course kind of goes through 12 major world religions, beginning with indigenous spirituality. Uh, I say it because I think we have the majority of the world have a, a, a faith and have a spirituality and a belief system. And that's beautiful. And that should be their, their own personal belief system. However, our entire world has been constructed under these and through these belief structures. They've created cultures. They've created law. They've created war. So in order to understand the world, the idea that we don't need to understand faith and religion, and I usually separate those two words. I put faith in this nice flowery column, which you know, is beautiful. And then I put religion as institutionalized and weaponization of said faith in order to gain power, control, and manipulation. And I think you need to be able to talk about that across the board. And by the way, of all religions, of all religions, and you can go down and talk about how you know, the foundation of this state, what it was and how religion then created this law and this sort of formulation and how it then transformed. And then maybe perhaps our students can look at the entire sort of, uh, I guess, the, the entire painting, the entire history of that and decide what serves us, what doesn't serve us, what we should keep personal and what has a place in actually having discussions and debates about traditions that are benefiting humanity and traditions that are not? 
And, and that's a hard, listen, that's a horribly hard conversation to have. And 90% of teachers probably would say, Joanna, I'm never doing it. But that's the only discussion, in my opinion, worth having. Wow. If I can say the horrible things, the bad things, if I can speak about Canadian history and I can talk about the horrible history of residential schools and the impact of our on our Indigenous community, if I can do that, but whatever country you come from, we can't talk about the skeletons in your closet. Are you okay? <laughs> the I, just... I don't care what country you come from. I don't care what religion you practice. If you can't raise issue and and criticism of that place, you're not an honest person. We're not having an honest discussion. You've been too brainwashed. Come back to me when you can have a talk. I just the first I, step in solving a problem is yeah. admitting you have you a problem. have to stop it. I I I, I want to call this episode. Are you okay <laughs> with, with with Joe the Veep? Are you okay? And, and specifically, America, are you okay? Like, are you okay? 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 Okay, so I my, my God, this is so great. Honestly, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you, I'm a I'm a cheerleader for our show. We interview incredible people. We just interviewed a brilliant religious scholar who wrote a book, The Violent Take It by Force, which I recommend. It really explained to me finally why religious people uh, support an amoral man like Trump. It's literally like they look at him as someone who can conquer their power mountains. But I want to get to. We're going to show a bit of the clip of the day that you uh, first, uh, you, the day that you first worked as vice principal, the, the day that you actually, you know, that you day got has the, stopped. <laughs> you, you got the job, your VP, you show us your dope ass outfit, and then you take us through your day. And the reason I want to show that clip and actually we'll pause, let's see some of it. And then I'll ask you the question. First day of school, I'm going to show you my fit. First of all, check out my shoes. I'm ready to educate, I'm ready to veep, and I'm going to take you with me. Let's go. Just so I know exactly where to park. All right, I'm going to take you through what I've accomplished on the first day of school as the veep and a teacher. Throughout day one, I've made 17 course adjustments. And I've had five new kids move into History 12. Apparently I should make it harder. Showed all of our students the new mascot, Lore the Lion. This morning, I talked a brand new student out of being anxious. And by the end of the day, she didn't even want to leave. I talked another new student into filming a documentary over the course of the whole semester leading up to our school rock concert for charity. Move desks to fill classrooms. Showed not one, not two, not three, but four students how to get into a locker. Okay, what is it? Round three times. Back twice. What's the next number? And then go right to it. 15. Oh, I'm so good at this. Gave out 32 high fives. I learned how to use the photocopier all by myself. Handed out history textbooks. Finished my first class of History 10 and History 12. Handed out outlines, dates to know, assignment due dates, and full assignment descriptions. Covered. Established not one, but two morning practices for girls volleyball. And it doesn't even start till after Christmas. They really want to win. Had our very first staff meeting as V, right here in this office. <laughs> Did I feed the fish? created a permission form for Friday's entire school event where we're going to go do team building up north. Unfortunately, now I have to collect all the permission forms signed. <sighs> and I watched a student who last year was quiet and introverted and really didn't want to talk come to school this year laughing, joking, and engaged in every single class they went in. I didn't get to use this once today. Day one over, but now I need some McDonald's. And I think a nap. So along with me knowing that, you know, you're a super likable educator. And if we had a vice principal like you, when I was coming up back in the middle ages of the middle eighties, I think a lot of people would have turned out better to be honest with you. No. Uh, we, ha we had kind of an authoritarian deal going down back in right, that period. Right, right. But 
what not only did I understand the workload and all the things that you have to do in order to be an educator, but there's a moment in that clip where you talk about how you were able to actually console a student and talk them off the ledge of anxiety. Mm. And I just, I, I just want to honor that and have you talk a little bit about what this world that we're living in right now, this techno, what I call sometimes techno fascism. Yes, it, it's good. It connects us, but there is the downside. What is it bringing to young people and what do you recommend we do about it? It, you know what the funny part is? So uh, obviously, because I'm on TikTok all the time or I'm on Instagram or wherever I am, I don't have a very negative relationship with uh, technology, not in the same way a lot of educators do. I also, I want to be very clear. I also, even though my job is seemingly nonstop, I, I have, I am very lucky to be working in a school that is a small, it is a private school that's a small private school in which um, I know all of my students. I can walk mm -hmm. in the hall and I know, which I think is my number one. If you're going to go to private school and you're going to a private school where your principal and vice principal don't know your kid as soon as they step into that hall, stop spending the money. You're wasting it. The, my, my point is to know if a kid walks in that door and is instantaneously having a bad day. And that bad day could be caused by, you're right, harassment on social media, and it could be an anxiety from that. There could be an addiction quality. And I've definitely seen lots of kids suffering from uh, a need, not funnily enough, to be on social media because we think all the kids are attached to social media. They don't care. They stopped caring about TikTok the moment I came on. I s swear to God. The adults make everything uncool. They don't care. We've ruined it. If we really want to figure it out, we'll figure out how to ruin Snapchat because that's where they all are. Okay. But yeah. I have kids. It'll be something they'll do that distracts them from social interactions. We've always had those kids, guys. Yeah. We've always had those kids. Yeah. Those kids either you know, did other things that we would deem and excuse my language, but we would have called them, you know, weird or antisocial or no. whatever back then. And they would have gone to a different part of the school or heaven help them. They just would have left altogether. They just wouldn't have stayed. Um, so kids today are finding like I have kids that will have like drawing on their iPads, like they'll or they'll color or they'll. But it's constant. And what I've realized, it's diminishing a level of social anxiety that they have, but they're still in that space. Yeah. So I don't see it coming from that way altogether. Here's where I see it coming from with kids. We have a world, and, it, and this is a good and a bad, we have a world now where we're very quick to diagnose and label kids with things that they're struggling with. We could say, you know, you're on the spectrum, ADD. We could talk about learning disabilities. We could talk about reading, whatever, whatever the case may be. And by the way, if the three of us were all diagnosed right now, we'd all have something, if not five somethings. <laughs> it's true, yeah. right? The only difference yeah. in the nineties was that nobody cared. Yeah, true. You either figured out how to fit in the box or you got the hell out. Yeah. So, I appreciate the diagnosis. I appreciate appreciate the understanding. What I don't appreciate, and this is predominantly in a lot of public systems, some private systems, I don't appreciate the modification. So if a student comes in, let's say with dyslexia, whatever level, and there's lots of different types and lots of different, you know, sort of gradients about that. If a student comes in with dyslexia, my job as an educator, in my opinion, is to get them the resource. I don't, I, I'm not trained in how to fix or how to overcome or how to deal with my yeah. job is to figure out what resources do I get this family in order to help this kid overcome? How can I accommodate, not modify, meaning how can I structure tests and structure learning so that he or she is able to still learn while dealing with bettering themselves and overcoming this issue Rather than, because this is what our schools do, completely modify, change the expectation of the course so they don't ever have to get better 
at what they are struggling with and we ignore that it ever existed. Where do you think anxiety is coming from? We've told kids they're not capable and then we've changed education to allow them to pass the course anyway. And we're doing it because public schools and some private schools, they don't have the money, they don't have the resources, they don't have the time. It's not that teachers don't want to do it. It's that government officials and economic systems aren't allowing us to do what we need to do in a new age of education. As a mother, and I'm sure Hi-Fi feels this as a father, I'm sucking back tears because you're making me think of every amazing educator who stepped in and took an interest in my kids. Right. And, and my daughter graduated from Wellesley and my son, who was not academically interested uh, because of an educator, set a goal and graduated with honors from UCLA. And that is because teachers took an interest. So I am so grateful that you went into the teaching profession because I can already feel your heart and your compassion and your passion for your work is helping your children. And alternately, I am grateful to the educators that you work with who uh, appreciate you for who you are and that you can show up every day as, as who you are without having to run it through any filters. And I think yeah. that's incredible. And right now in America, uh, there are so many uh, groups under threat. And as you know, uh, people like Ron DeSantis went whole in um, attacking the gay population in Florida attacking whatever population he could find. And we happen just to be, his day. we happen to be, well, right? yeah. yeah, I That's just wrote about, day. I just wrote about Hitler and Goebbels. And, sure. uh, and I got to tell you, there was some funny things there, old brooding Goebbels. But I, br I, I bring it up because we're networked with a group in Florida called Equality Florida. We're friends with the people who run it and they have managed to mobilize people and defeat uh, a nearly a couple dozen of, of Ron DeSantis's worst bills. But how do how do we how do we wake Americans up to the fact that human rights are under siege and that um, it affects everybody? It's not just the person over here, the person there, the daughter over here, the aunt over there. It's like everyone is being attacked when they are trying to run through some of the most vulnerable populations. Well, I, I mean, I would say it always starts with education, but here's the the unfortunately diabolic, diabolical genius, and I use that word loosely, okay, of the alt-right right now, because they've demonized education. Education right now is the they. And the reason why they're doing it, for two reasons, and by the way, one is, I think one is, is strategic and one is just simply practical. The first one's strategic because if I demonize they, I can control the spread of information. I can then hop on different bandwagons depending on whose agenda. Like if the alt-right Christian network doesn't want me teaching evolution, cool. I say that there's no department of education. You guys go ahead and teach what you want. But on the practical side, it's just about money, right? Education is- expensive. We know that. We and it's that. just about how do I cut money and then give people the illusion, the pretense of my economy going out. And, and in 20 years, when it all comes crashing down, because we no longer can compete, which, by the way, we can barely compete right now. When right. we no longer can compete 20 years from now, it doesn't matter to me, because guess what? My 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 term is done. My office is over. I've wow. made the, the money that I need to make. There shouldn't be a single person in politics that doesn't talk about expanding and growing educational funding, transforming the nature of education. In my opinion, it should be national. And I understand your states are going to want to hate me because heaven help me. We have a national anything in your country. We but don't care. A kid we in don't Alabama care. should be getting the same education as a kid in California, a kid in Wisconsin. They should have the same access points. They should have the same extra help. They should have the same standards. Throw out the SAT 
and try to implement actual education where kids are allowed to question and debate and have conferences and challenge their teachers and pull in every resource under their sun. And at the same time, if they're not getting it, if they choose not to do the work or they're not necessarily at that academical, academic level yet, guess what? They're gonna have to fail the course. And that's not leaving a kid behind, that's understanding that a, that a student wasn't ready for the challenge yet. And it's our job to get them ready. And if we were real honest about kids who aren't quite at the right level, rather than pushing them through um, under the illusion that we're just like, well, they got to stay with their friends. Levels of anxiety are going through the roof as that kid's trying to do grade nine math and they still can't do grade five math. Yeah, We did that. And we did that by underfunding elementary right. and pretending as though they're babysitters. Are we okay? Elementary <laughs> okay. school should be getting paid. Teachers should be way more than me. And in my opinion, way more specialized than me. The fact mm -hmm. that we don't have math teachers teaching math. Yeah. And we're curious at yeah. why they can't do grade 10 math. Yeah. It's not, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand. Well, because we pretend that a math teacher for grade three, just because you can do the math means you can teach the math. Well, that's not the case. Yeah. You have to explain the math. That takes a certifiable genius to a kid who doesn't get it. You need 17 ways till Sunday to explain that form of, of arithmetic, let's say. And that's foundational. You've either built a kid that says, I can do anything, I can accomplish anything, even if it's hard. Or you built a kid that will, you know, as an adult will say, I hate math. And the reason why I hate math was because in grade three, my teacher told me I was stupid or my, my teacher allowed me to be stupid and still passed me through. I, I pulled my son out of a school because of a math teacher who was actually a home ec teacher that they turned I'm into saying. a math teacher. So like, like all of that. And uh, and when I was in high school, I'm still scarred by a geometry teacher who assumed I was done because I sat with the football players. So I happened to go to uh, Catholic school with, and so I switched out, got the only D in my life. And I switched out to a class with somebody named Mr. Brandmeier who smoked his chalk all through class. Cause he was a, you know, a chain smoker stayed with me after school with his, nic with his nicotine breath and taught me geometry and I got an A minus and yeah. God bless you, Mr. Brandmeier. Oh, I'm getting so emo right now, but this speaks yeah. to the heart of it. I just did a podcast this morning where one of the topics was project 2025, which is a recipe for the end of democracy. And one of the ways they're doing it is by destroying the department of education. Right. So high fidelity, anything else you want to ask this genius, this <laughs> genius bonafide. So th this this may sound a little out there, but right now, I believe that the working class and the freedoms that liberal society provides us are under attack uh, by a billionaire class, as well as adversarial authoritarian governments, etc. Um, how shall I phrase this? Do you feel that the changing standards, the increase in class size, the lack of funding, uh, is this kind of a long-term attack on education as one of the facets of the billionaire war against people? I'm going to say, I don't even know if it's an unpopular answer. I don't necessarily subscribe to a bunch of men sitting in the room rubbing their hands together deciding how to control the masses here's what i think when we challenge when we speak about billionaire and their power what we're really speaking about is the end game of capitalism which is the problem it's too much power if money denotes power billionaires or anybody making it their interest is in how do I make more and gain more power? And, and to me, it's a money drive. So if we're going to live in a capitalist system 
where we are driven in our world to amass as much of a surplus fortune as we possibly can. If that is our goal, we will destroy ourselves. And that's always been the problem with capitalism. And when I talk about this, people instantaneously, oh, you're such a communist. I'm like, listen, obviously that didn't play out either. But when we talk about Marx and we talk about his primary issue, which is the alienation of humanity from their labor, because when we sell it and when we do things that aren't who we are or when we do things that don't, you know, because he talked a lot about the assembly line, when we don't do things to their completion, we are not filling our soul. And so how have we tried to fill it? Well, we've tried to fill it by putting a million dollars in our bank account and we assume that's going to make us feel better. And when it doesn't, and we're still void of purpose and we're want to know why mental health is at an all time high because people are making millions of dollars drop shipping. Who cares? How do you have any purpose in your soul from that? Day trading. Want to know why day trading is at an all time high suicide rate? Because there's nothing of substance but money in that profession. And when you're trying to figure out how money can make more money, can make more money, humanity gets pushed aside and education, which by the way, was created in order to put people on the assembly line and make them little automaton workers, which were so far past, which is why education needs a complete and utter revolution. But when that's the case, we are starting to see it's very easy for, for those people to say, well, this model, like just, just chuck it all and homeschool your kids or chuck it all and go to private school. It's to me, it's all about an end game of money and about the pretense that that should be the only goal of your existence because we've chucked everything else. Joanna, I would love for you to lead the education revolution <laughs> and the revamping of it. I, I am so sincere when I say that. Uh, I, I think the end game of capitalism is our theme. I mean, I just think that that is so true. It's such a and stupid end game. It, it is. It is. Well, it's not good for anybody. It's, it's not. It's, it's, it's not good. It's not good for anybody. We have. We why have, are they building bunkers if it's good for them? We it's have so global warming anybody. to contend with. We need our scientists. We need our educators. Right. Uh, my my last question for you, and I'm so grateful to you for coming on our podcast today. I'm I'm uh, indebted. Oh, my okay. last question is: We have a week before the most consequential election in American history since the Civil War. Is there anything that you can leave our viewers with that you would like them to think about? Those who have not yet cast their ballot. Don't be led astray by the Coliseum show. When they, when they let in the lions and they fight the monsters and they put on the show and they give you free popcorn or a million dollars to sign his petition, don't be led astray by the show because it's the show where you are going to hand over your liberty with thunderous applause. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for being on RadPod. Thank you. Today, I'm going to tackle the U.S. presidential election system, including and focused on the Electoral College. Now, for this, you're going to need to sit down. You're going to need to have a cup of tea. You're going to need to meditate a little bit because it gets confusing. And to be honest, it gets frustrating. Let's go. First of all, the Electoral College actually elects your president. It's not you. So when you say you have a direct democracy, you really don't have a direct democracy and don't talk to me about a republic. The Electoral College has 538 members. Now, in order to win the presidency out of those 538, this is just simple math, you need 270 people in the Electoral College to vote for you for you to become president. Okay, how do we get to 538? Here it is. It represents 100 senators. It represents 435 members of the House of Representatives and three people from D.C. They get a lot of representation.
Now, given those numbers, each state gets allocated a specific number of votes as their population goes up and down, so does their electoral college number, in order to vote for President of the United States. I'm going to draw the United States so you get a full picture. Here we go. We got a little California. We got a little Texas panhandle. We come down. We do a little bit of Florida. Look, I even drew on Florida, so don't get mad at me. We go all the way up. Get Maine, New York, come down, go up to Minnesota a little bit, back over a little Wisconsin. All right, it might not be perfectly laid out, but you get the point. Now let me give you some numbers. Here you got California, right? They get 54 electoral college votes. Over here you got Texas. They get 40. Oof. Over here you get Florida. Heaven help us, they get 30. You got Wisconsin up here with 10. You got Minnesota with 10, and in here somewhere you get 28 for New York. Are you with me so far? Just to round it out, you get Alabama with 9, Alaska 3, North Dakota and South Dakota 3 each. You got to give them the same because otherwise they fight in the Dakotas. Tennessee has 11. Are you getting the idea? So every state has a number allocated for it, and then each of the candidates run in each state, and that's where the election happens. Here's where it gets messy though, okay? Except for Nebraska and Maine, all other states in the US, 50, oh my God, I forgot Hawaii way out here. All of those states actually have a winner take all situation. So if you get 51% of the popular vote in that state or 91, it doesn't matter, you get all of their electoral college votes. If you win California, you get 54. If you win Texas, you get 40. 30 in Florida, are you with me so far? Okay, let's compare Wisconsin and Minnesota, right? Both have 10 electoral college seats. Let's say the Democrat here wins 53%, they get all 10 seats. Let's say the Republican here gets 91%, they still only get 10 seats, even though 42% 42% more people voted for the Republican in the United States. So technically, once you do the whole U.S. of A, you could have a huge difference between popular vote and electoral college vote. Now, a lot of people are like, why have the electoral college at all? It makes no sense. Why not have one person, one vote? Doesn't that seem more democratic? Stop with the Republic stuff. Here's why, because back in 1787, that's when the Constitution was written, back in 1787, it was a compromise. Some people wanted the House of Representatives to elect the, the president, and other people wanted it directly elected from the people. So this was a compromise, but that's not the full answer. All right, so let me give you three reasons to why the Electoral College. They're not good reasons, but I'm gonna give them to you anyway. Number one, they thought the, the electorate wasn't very smart. They didn't think they were educated enough, wise enough, whatever, intelligent enough to handle their own democratic future. That's hilarious coming from the world's best democracy that you keep complaining you are. Number two, they feared that a headstrong democratic mob would take over the countryside. What? Isn't that what the Constitution is for? To make sure that nobody takes over minority rights? And number three, they didn't like the idea of a populist president because they thought, and here's the real kicker, it would override state rights. You gotta remember guys, the United States became the United States not because they loved each other and not because they wanted to form some greater union, but they understood that unless they forged a union, that Britain would come back and kick their butt back into colonization. But they wanted to make sure that each state had way more power than they absolutely needed to in order to ensure that a new king would never take over. Unless that king's Elon Musk, because they're absolutely fine with that.